We'll pray for you as I pray. Please. Father in heaven, bless Ryan, bless us, have mercy on all of us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The subject this morning is uh, First Things First, Part 2. This is the second of 50 things we're going to study. Now, again, I said yesterday, before you hit the ground running, it pays to know the ground rules. So today, we're going to study another uh, ground rule, if that's okay. Uh, ground rules don't change no matter where you go. True? I just used as an example. This is the uh, border of North Korea and China. The subject that morning is... Sure, no, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Wait, don't worry. Yeah. Looks like Wisconsin. It's cold. I worked at the North Pole. It's cold. That was cold. This is this is uh, north of North Korea in January. Yeah, that was cold. Yeah. I bet he's got a couple of pair underwear on. I don't know what I had on. It was cold. I know that. My mind was more on that, that border behind me. The guy with me said, you step across that border, they'll grab you. Uh, I said, who'll grab you? Nobody there. Uh, yes. They said, you step across the border, you'll find out where they're at. <laughs> so, I said, okay, I almost did. Oh, I better not. <laughs> All right. All right, so now, you're, let's say uh, the lecture that morning is, you know, you're, you're talking to Chinese, Buddhists, most part are atheists, atheists and Buddhists, communists. Uh, even if you could use the Bible in Mrs. White, there's not a word about chocolate in there, period. So what are you going to use? I and mean, you're going to talk to the people. You want to convince them. You want to be reasonable, credible. You want to be careful. What are you going to say? If you can't say anything about, if you could, she doesn't mention chocolate. What do you use? What do you use? Fruit. Fruit? No. <laughs> so this is it. This is the health center in China. And this is where I was, and this is Seven Day Adventist Sanitarium, and this are the lectures. And a lot of people coming were uh, mostly, you know, they're all communists, mostly, and this, that, and the other. And uh, the, the subject that morning was changing. All improvement requires change, right? Everybody would agree. That's common sense, that's reasoning. Subject this morning is science. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, science. By the way, God Himself is the originator of science, right? And when Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, beware the oppositions of science falsely so-called. There is a false science. There is a true science. Beware of the false, because it opposes the true. Okay. But because there's a lot of false science doesn't mean there's not a true. Because... Uh, Sister Nicole, would you like to read this short but succinct statement? There are few who understand that all true human science is from the God of science, and that God demonstrates to the world that He is king over all. Yeah, and the facts are in Thailand, uh, you don't get far with the Bible. They say they're Buddhist. So, science. Where do you start? Food science. Now, is there a science in food? In Thailand, do they listen to food science? No. Do they? They should. They should. Yeah. If they're reasonable. Because yeah. if they won't listen to science, what will they listen to? Mm -hmm. If they won't listen to the facts, God is a God of science, right? God sends down science. If they won't listen to that, what will they listen to? So you present food science. I got it from where? Iowa State. <laughs> right? Do they have a... No, no let me, let me uh, regress one more. Can you use true science to make junk food? Yes. yes, I'm not saying all true science is good. It doesn't produce good things necessarily. You can use good science to build atomic bombs. They did. But I'm saying you, food science, culinary food service, there is science behind food. And we ought to learn it. Don't you think so? Don't you think? Sister Leah? Parents and their children should learn to cook more simply than is usually done. 
The preparation of so many varied and complex dishes so absorbs the time and, the, and attention of many that they are disqualified to teach the truth as it is in Jesus. You can learn it, and you should be able to teach it. But you should teach it simply. You ought to be a simple cook. What's that mean? You interpret that for yourself. You know, what, what does it mean to be a simple cook simplicity? I don't know. You decide. But I know this, more cooking schools should be established and some should labor from house to house, giving instruction. Wait a minute, that's not door to door, that's kitchen to kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A labor from house to house, giving instruction in the art of cooking wholesome food. So if you go into Bangkok and they all have these gastric ulcers, the place in the house to start is which room? The kitchen. The kitchen. Because medical missionary work includes what? Who are Sister Reverend A? The foundation of that which keeps people in health is the medical missionary work of good cooking. Now, not just to cook, just cook. You got to cook simply. You got to cook. The food should look good, should smell good, should taste good, should make you feel good. That's the kind of uh, good food a good cook produces. Are you a good cook? No. Can you learn? Yeah. Yes. It's food science. Now, having said all that, I go back to chocolate. Hershey, Pennsylvania is sweet, but not healthy. <laughs> I did evangelistic meetings here about three or four years ago. And uh, but again, nothing in the inspired writings about chocolate. It depends. Can you go into Hershey, talk about chocolate, and people say, he's reasonable at least. <laughs> can you? Can you? Should you be able to? Yes. Yeah, should you be able to? Now, if you if you got a closet addiction to Hershey Kisses, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> but I'm not, I don't know. You just, so, you know, I love you and everything. But uh, if you're going into Hershey, you ought to have some science. Because if you don't have science, and of course, it's, it's evangelistic meetings. You have a Bible. They, they expect a Bible. Mrs. White comes later, right? You've had the Bible. Nothing about chocolate in the Bible. You're going to the evangelistic meetings. And there's nothing in the Bible about chocolate. Now, there are principles there, but methylxanthine, a theobromine, caffeine, that's not in the Bible. So what are you going to use? You better have some science. Yeah, so uh, what they give it away free there, right? <laughs> yeah, we give away the health message. We do Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. Jesus is talking about the ministry of healing. So they got their chocolate, we've got ours. By the way, that's a real Hershey's candy bar. That's a, that's a big one, right? That's a real candy bar. <laughs> Chocolate world. Yeah, let me, uh, by the way, I really got some lessons here. The Lord really, yeah, gave me some lessons here. Health is a neutral forum. That means that people can come that aren't Christians and don't feel threatened. Exactly. It's neutral. So when I was asked by the, uh, the, is it the Pennsylvania Conference to do evangelistic meetings, I said, well, I'll do it, but let's use health. This is the flyer from the meetings that we were working on it. So it was balanced living. So in John 6, you got the bread of life, but then you got bread baking class. Everything had a Bible parallel. You had health and you had the Bible. And then a Mennonite lady came. After her first night, she brought her brother. After her next night, brought their mother. And people were coming that were not Christians because they were interested in health. Calling the, li the, the lame, the blind, you know, they, they're coming in. And they're really not coming in to hear the Bible. So I said, I said, listen, bring your Bible and bring your cookbook. <laughs> and they came. What's the subject tonight? Uh, sugar. <laughs> now, you got to have reason, credibility. You got to be careful. Got to be careful. You got to be comprehensive today. Science. They always ask, you know, in, in, invariably, when you talk about food, somebody will say, well, what did you have for breakfast? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, uh, this, boom, I showed them a picture. That's what I had for breakfast. Can you tell what that is? Mm -hmm. guacamole. guacamole. Yep, that guacamole. You sure you're sharp to get that one. Potato. Sweet potato. Yep. Carrots. It looks like toast. Carrots and peas. And peas. And corn. And, and that was a uh, good whole wheat bread toasted. And I can't remember what was inside there. Mm -hmm. I forgot. Something white or something. And it was it was it was whole food plant based. Really, it mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't anything like a you know it wasn't a scrambled egg or something. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm serving. And I say, this is what I'm serving up at my house. What are you serving up? Then they tell me this. Oh, no, this is what they say. Because, no, 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 no. Hershey wow. is famous for their recipes. And so are 
We, oui. you got to fight fire with fire. <laughs> so I say, okay, Hershey's and recipe business, huh? What else you got? Oh, well, we've got all that too. I said, well, as long as you don't bring out a chocolate cheesecake, oh, we have one of those too. <laughs> and I said, fire with fire, there we go. Here they are, the vegan recipes. So now on, on my website, lukekeith.org, there's a place there for resources. It says, send me an email, I'll send you all the, you got hundreds and hundreds, you know that, the hundreds and hundreds of recipes. Send me an email, I'll send you all the recipes. He will? What's it cost? <laughs> Come on, what's it cost? Free! Whole food, plant-based, nothing refined, no oils, no refined sugar. Whole food, plant-based, nothing processed, nothing refined. Eat your heart's content. And if you have a question, give me a call. Now you give the recipes because you got the Savior right here. Mm -hmm. The recipes go to the Mennonites first and then comes Jesus. Amen. It's pretty simple. Now what I learned there, it really surprised me. I had never in my life done a cooking class. I can cook about six things. My repertoire includes <laughs> granola, waffles. How about yours, David? <laughs> you got six? <laughs> and, uh, 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 Oliver, what do you, you got six? No, <laughs> yeah, okay, no, no you got six. I got six at least. Ryan, he's not here. Oh. So, and so I, up there, I said as we were planning the meeting, I said, why don't we offer a health day on Sunday? What's a health day? They never, uh, what a health day? Why don't we start it like at 7 in the morning? You come in, we'll do the exercise. I exercise every day. I know how to exercise. We'll exercise, we'll, go, uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll hit the road, road work. I, I do that every morning. I take my walk. Exercise, walk. I'll cook brec breakfast for them. Did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> breakfast for them. We'll eat, have a cooking class, have lunch, have a health day. And so we started the meetings, and we had, a, we had a, a good, fairly good attendance, but not the same people every day. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would announce, coming next Sunday when the meeting said, we're having a health day. So we had, you know, faces would change. A lot of them were coming every night, but faces would change. But on the health day, guess who signed up? Everybody. Everybody. I figured I'd have to feed 20. Yeah, pretty soon it became apparent <laughs> going we had to feed a lot. And I was, I, wait a minute, I got to cook waffles for how many people? And granola? And this is one of the guys at the meetings. Now the people are sitting, you can't see, I'll show you the people in a second. So everything in the cooking school, they did. I said, somebody come up and work the Vitamix <laughs> that knows how <laughs> or is teachable. And they came up and they did. We made soy milk from whole, whole, whole soybeans, right? Just like we do here, the whole bean soy milk. Made three kinds of granola, made waffles, made, I can't remember what I made. Then I showed them, if you go to Walmart, you need to buy West soy. This is unsweet and it's got all the good stuff in it. And then we, we gave breakfast. Now we already did the, the, the road work. We did the exercises. Some could barely walk five feet. Others could, you know, chug along pretty well. And everybody came. And then in 1933, the General Conference put out a book. I'm going to give it to you. It'll be here in a few days. I've ordered it. It's free. Give each one of you a copy of this book. I always thought it was called A Call to Medical Evangelism. That is not the title. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to read the title? A Call to Medical Evangelism and Health Education. Education is part of the method, me message, method, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but the Bible and the body. You know, it's, 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 it, they go to together, don't they? Psalms 139 verse 14, I am fearfully and that's the body, right? So, uh, yesterday I said something. Today I'd like to spend about 40 minutes on it. I said, whether it's breast cancer, whatever it may be, um, I suggest you fully inform yourself. What if they don't know how? Dear friends, our message is to health education. You show them how to be fully informed. So I use this one because this is a hot topic right now. I'm not going to say anything controversial. This is a hot topic. Uh, the vaccine. Well, uh, I think you should be fully informed. Study everything you can find, then uh, fully inform yourself, then pray and ask the Lord to help you make your choice. Now use Bible principles to explain it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved. You got to be approved. Let the Lord's word have what free reign. Now that verse in 2 Timothy 2, 15 is followed by avoid godless chatter. 
That's a call to come away from what men said and come to what God said. Is God the true scientist? Yes. Is there some true science out there? Yes. Nothing in the Bible about COVID-19. Is there pestilence? Yes. There's nothing in the Bible about the pandemic we're having. Now, the principles are there. I agree they're there. Come on. The principles are there. But the question I face today, how do you find something in the Bible about that? Well, if you... If you don't have true science and you don't have the Bible, what's left? Godless chatter, half-baked conspiracy theories and confusion in the, in the words of men. And if you have the words of men, you do not have the words of God. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 9, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verse 2, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Do what men say, not what God says. God speaks through science. It's His creation. Matthew, uh, Psalms 19, verse 1, The heavens do what? They declare the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Huh, you're very good when God made man. Fearfully and wonderfully made. So do what? Fear God, Revelation 14, 7. Now, to do it in a way that is sensible, reasonable, you still keep your credibility. I went to uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Now, you got a bunch of people that like allopathic medicine. They buddied up with the system, right? They like it when you quote this. We're not talking about you. We're talking about evangelism. They like it. Oh, Journal of American Medical Association. Okay, yeah. I'm quoting from them. COVID-19 is the leading cause of death in the United States. Now, wait. You know how many people that's killed? Since February last year? Yeah. Over 350,000, they claim. Yeah, okay, all right. So let's say they're, they're saying, but heart disease kills over 550,000 every year. How can you, ah, oh, get the science. How can you say it's the leading killer in the United States if heart disease kills far more? This is how you can say it. And you come into something called co comorbidities. And this is okay. Keep using that word. It's nice to know what that word means. This is out of that JAMA article. Important. Now, nothing but science. Nothing you can put your foot in and kick me with this morning. Because I've not said one word controversial. Okay. I'm just saying, here's a claim made by, in the JAMA article, dated December 15th. This is right off the press. This is only two, three weeks old. It's now declared the number one killer in America. How can they say that? This is how. Importantly, the authors wrote, and I didn't change anything, this is right out of the JAMA article. Death rates for the two leading causes, heart disease and cancer, are about 17 to 1600 people. Not, not, not per year now, it's per day. That's how they can say it. Mm -hmm. In December, the per day deaths of COVID were higher than heart disease and cancer combined. And that's a fact. Now, wait a minute. You say, wait, 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 hold on a second. Because remember, you're talking to the people that, that are, that are, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Uh, COVID-19 deaths have surpassed these numbers individually throughout December and on Wednesday beat them combined. More than 3,400 deaths were reported according to the COVID tracking project, marking an all-time high that continues to increase. Hospitalizations were also at a new high with more than 113,000 COVID-19 patients. Anyway, so that's it. Now, you say, but the death certificate that says COVID-19, there are underlying factors. That's what we call comorbidities. Somebody had diabetes or they had heart disease or they had some kind of, uh, they had some kind of respiratory problem. And and then they die when they get COVID-19, but what pushed them over the edge was the heart disease, not this, uh, this, this virus. Well, dear friends, that's as old as the hills. Something, you know, metabolic syndrome's been around for a long time. That is what metabolic syndrome is. You have more than one of these certain factors that predispose you to increase rate, rates of, uh, of death, higher death rates. Comorbidity is a presence of two or more, right? So if you have a, if you're obese, does it increase your chance of getting diabetes? It explains your demise. Thank you. Yeah, come on, yeah. That's old, that's, that's metabolic syndrome. So what they're saying about COVID-19, it's true. If you didn't have heart disease, you weren't obese, and you didn't have congestive heart failure, well, your chances of dying are, are, are not that great. But if you do, that increases your risk of dying. 
Okay, that's scientific. Nobody would argue with that. Condition, but nobody knows what most people don't know what comorbidity factors are. You say, oh, what's that? This is what they are. Conditions considered comorbid. Com Comorbidities are all they use, they use words that you can't say <laughs> are often long term or chronic conditions. The word chronic means persisting for more than 90 days, usually. So, diabetes is a chronic disease and a lifestyle disease, and they may or may not be associated with each other. Now, I'm getting to something, we're working our way toward it. Morbidity, of course, that's a disease state. Mortality is you're dying, <laughs> morbidity is you're just sick, right? Now, metabolic syndrome. They got all these key numbers. Here they are. And when you got more than one, two added to three, you're really jacking up your risk of dying. So the big number is listed here, uh, blood pressure, bl uh, glucose, body mass index. You got the, these big cholesterol, the big indicators. But also in, in more finer print, you'll see LDL being elevated, HDL being too low, different things, triglycerides skyrocketing. So it's the numbers. And dear friends, numbers don't lie. That's it. Boom. Numbers don't lie. Your blood pressure is 220 over 160. You cannot say you're normal. <laughs> you can't say it. Numbers don't lie. That is God and that's science. My cholesterol, they, they say, the government says under 200. They really, the, the lifestyle guys say under 150. Your cholesterol is 375. Your blood sugar under 100 fasting in the morning is normal. Your blood sugar is 380. Your cholesterol is 375. Triglycerides should be under uh, 250. Your clock, your 100. Your triglycerides are 800. You're sick. But I feel fine. Doesn't matter how you feel. You're sick. This is the science of comorbidities, also known as metabolic syndrome. That's it. So when somebody says, well, COVID-19, it didn't kill them. It just pushed them over the edge. We've always been teaching that. We've always been talking about metabolic syndrome. Not killed by heart disease, but you're a diabetic, and the leading cause of, of, of death in type 2 diabetes is a coronary event. If you weren't diabetic, you may not have had that heart attack. Yeah, comorbidity. So, COVID-19 stamped on the death certificate, but what about all these factors? We've always had that. They don't pay. Hmm? They don't pay. They don't pay. They don't pay. So, uh, this NCBI, you keep seeing it pop up. National Center for Biotechnology Information. NCBI. Why do I bring that up? Because can you read the little title down there? You gotta have good eyes. Randomized. Yeah. How they design research. This is the gold standard, a randomized control trial. And the reason it's important to know that is because we're going to get to PubMed Medline in a second. This is how you learn. It tells you what kind of trial it was. And when you see a randomized control trial, then you're going to know what it means because we're going to study what it is for just a moment or two. Clinical trials are commonly classified into phases. Each phase, remember the Pfizer thing, phase one, phase two, phase three? Mm -hmm. Now, they don't say much about phase four. Mm -hmm. Phase four is a study of long-term effects. And how are you gonna study five years later when they're just now giving it? Mm -hmm. but, but hold on. I'm not, no, each phase is characterized by its design and sample size. What is phase one trial anyway? Inform yourself. A phase one is characterized by its design and sample size. Phase one trials usually test the interventions in healthy volunteers and aim to address safety issues as well as uh, pharmaco pharmacokinetics and dose response characteristics. <laughs> what they're saying to see if it's safe, uh, efficient, and effective. Basically, they're looking at, you know, it's, it's the first questions. Safe is always number one. Phase two trials are designed to determine the evidence of activity or optimal dosage. Phase three trials are usually pivotal studies designed because if it passed one and two, phase three is very important because it passed one and two. Pivotal study, uh, pivotal data for approval by authorities testing new interventions either against placebo or against standard treatments for superiority or non-inferiority respectively. Get that back to that in a second. Phase four studies, but I don't like the science. You don't like the science, what do you like? You don't like the Bible or the science, what do you like? Anecdotal studies, hot, hot, uh, gossip, hearsay, mm -hmm. conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. I like what men say, what men think. The guesswork that comes forth from Bubba, Ben, James, John, and... Isn't that true? 
I mean, you got to go with something. If you don't have science, you don't have Bible, what do you have? Your opinion, which is worth what? Phase 4 studies, I yellowed it out, assess safety data and are often conducted to receive approval for expanded indications after initial approval of the intervention. Now here's the problem. Although there is a considerable variability in timing and number of patients enrolled in the different study phases, a rule of thumb is that phase 1 studies, now remember I'm reading this to Buddhists. Phase 1 studies enroll up to 100 healthy volunteers over a period of up to 2 years. Phase 2, usually 300 folks. Phase 3, how many? You know why? Because before they will approve it, you have to reach an end point. That is a point of statistical significance. you got to be able to say, this is our research. For example, you got 100 people in the trial. One of them, all right, you got 100 people in the trial. It's a randomized trial. 50 here, 50 here, right? You randomize them. You threw 50 here, you threw 50 here. You have a control group, you have an experimental group. The control group gets nothing. They're controlled, except a placebo. This group over here, they get the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, so you give it to the placebo here and the uh, real vaccine here. You got 100 people. One of them gets COVID-19. Uh, which group were they in? Well, they were in the uh, control group. Does one person count for anything? It's not statistically significant. Stop. 50 people. It's not statistically significant. It's nothing. One person, you're going to give me a drug based on one person? <laughs> no. So what Pfizer had to do, now from the Pfizer website, they will not think you're anti-Pfizer if you use Pfizer's facts. And this is a fact. How many people did they have enrolled? 44,000. Why? To reach the end point very quickly. And they did. They had 170 confirmed cases of COVID-19. They had so many people. They could reach it in a very short time. Data from our large phase 3 study of 44,000 people has demonstrated that our vaccine candidate was 95% effective. And by the way, it's all blinded. They didn't know who was getting the placebo. The people giving it did not know. When you blind the study, the people getting it, the people giving it, the people doing it, nobody knew. It's everything was blinded. Except the people, the agencies that looked at their research. Am I for this drug? Not at all. I'm for science. What I'm saying are facts. Stick with the facts. Efficacy was consistent across age, race, ethnicity. Of course, they're trying to sell you the vaccine. Ah, yeah, it's Pfizer. The observed efficacy in adults over 65 years of age was over 94%. That's fine. But I'm just saying, when you quote Pfizer, you bridge the gap between the naysayers and the audience, the ones that think, suspect, you don't like science. You just quoted Pfizer. I'm going to quote them again. What data will Pfizer and BioNTech present to VRBPAC? I wrote it as the Vaccine Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. We are presenting, this is Pfizer. We are presenting all the data included in our uh, EUA, uh, Emergency Use Authorization, asking to get it early. Why? Because you got to weigh the risk against the benefits reasonable. And some people's blood just boils reading these things. Where'd you get your information? Somebody called me. They said, uh, we want to send our son to your school because we don't want to wear masks. I said, we wear masks. She said, they're trying to control us and make us wear masks. I said, who are they? One person said it's the Republicans. Another said the Democrats. Another said the World Bank. No, another said the World Bank. Another said the Pope. Another said, another said who can't get an answer on who they are. Who is they? Well, it depends on your disposition, your leaning, your background. You got a different they. Cooking in the conspiracy pot. Dear friends, that is not health evangelism. Health evangelism is science that is reasonable, has credibility. This conspiracy stuff will drive people away and say, that man is a nut. But nobody says you're nutty here, except the nuts. This is, these are facts. I don't believe those facts. Well, that's fine. But if you won't believe science and you won't believe God, who will you believe? This is life and death. The, 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 the ladder is going up. People are dying. And they're not going to jump on a ladder that's controlled by crazy men. 
uh, a meeting of two months, here's a problem. We also have data on approximately 19,000 trial participants who have been followed for a meeting of two months. That's not very long. <laughs> two months? The second and final dose of the vaccine candidate as well as data on our manufacturing process. Two months? So there's the uh, roadmap for trials for people that are trying to get drugs approved. Phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Now, what about phase four? National Cancer Institute didn't change the word, I blew it up. National Cancer Institute, that's science. Yeah, nobody's gonna be object to that. The type of clinical trial that studies the side effects caused over time by a new treatment after it has been approved and is on the market. These trials look for side effects that were not seen in earlier trials and may also study how well a new treatment works over a long period of time. By the way, a layman can read that and understand it. It's reasonable. Phase four, you look for problems. And uh, is, is it possible something turns up after five years that didn't turn up in the beginning? Yeah. Sure. I can name you 50 things. Uh, silicone breast implants, thought that was safe, right? <laughs> yeah, you five years later, it wasn't. There are a hundred things that the long term reveals things you can't see in the short. That's why they have phase four trials. That's why they have them. So here is the, uh, it's hard to read that I know, but the gold standard, the top, the randomized control trial, especially if it's blinded and has more than one group. And I just want to, uh, I mean, I mean, you're looking for science. You got to evaluate it somehow. A randomized control trial is a type of scientific experiment that aims to reduce certain sources of biases, bias when testing the effectiveness of new treatments. So you two groups, you experimental versus your control group, right? This is accomplished by randomly allocating subjects to two or more groups. You go that way, 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 you go that way. I'm a smoker. It doesn't matter. You got 100 people or 20 are smokers. We randomly divide them. You'll probably get about 10 in each one. You know, it doesn't matter. You randomize the, the groups. Allocating subjects to two or more groups, treating them differently, and then comparing them with respect to a measured response. Well, how do you treat them differently? One group, the experimental group, receives the intervention being assessed while the other, usually called the control group, receives nothing or placebo, right? They think they may be getting something, but they're not sure. The other group, they think they may be getting something, but it's, they're not sure. You can't have a placebo for exercise, right? If you're doing a study on, on Zoloft, an antidepressant, you give this one Zoloft, you give this one a, a, a pill, you give this one also exercise, you can't have a placebo for exercise. If you're not exercising, you know it, right? You can't do a placebo for everything. But when you can, it's very helpful. The experimental group receives the intervention being assessed while the other, usually called the control group, receives an alternative treatment such as a placebo or no intervention. The groups are monitored under conditions of the trial design to determine the effectiveness of the experimental intervention and efficacy is assessed in comparison to the control. There may be more than one treatment group or more than one control group. The trial may be blinded, meaning that information which may influence the participants is withheld until after the experiment is complete. A blind may be imposed on any participant of an experiment, including subjects, researchers, technicians, data analysis, and evaluators. Effective blinding may reduce or eliminate some sources of experimental bias. A well-balanced RCT is often considered the gold standard for clinical trials. Is there still some uh, shady science going on? Yeah, but this is the best we can find. You sound like one of them. Who's them? Yeah, who's them? A health evangelist cannot work if he is not reasonable, credible, careful, and comprehensive. You got to give up your ideas and let God's Word have free reign. If you don't, uh, magnets cure arthritis, I know, because it cured mine. That's anecdotal. That's an anecdote. It doesn't mean anything. It's based on your experience, which means 
Nothing. I had my eye read by an uh, uh, um, urology. Or I had the bumps phrenology. Or I had pressure points in my hand, uh, acupuncture or acupressure or all these things, right? Where's your science? There is none. You've got no science. You've got no foundation. You're building on the sand. How far are you going to get talking to the communist over there? You'll go nowhere if all you have are your opinions. They said, who are they? This is life and death. Uh, anecdotal. Who'd like to read, uh, uh, Brother David, you want to read what this anecdotal? This is research. Yeah, not necessarily true or reliable because it's based on personal accounts rather than facts or research. Yeah, when you accept bogus theories, you can disqualify yourself as a health evangelist. Grounded in science. Now, this is another kind of study. This is, uh, I use Gregor. I'm not saying I agree with everything Gregor says, but he's, he's you know, trying to do fact-based stuff. I want to play you a video clip. And as he does a little study here, watch what he calls it. Watch what, what kind of study, when, when, it, when it comes, somebody say, that's it! What kind of study is he using? Dr. Dean Ornish showed that a plant-based diet and lifestyle program could apparently reverse the progression of prostate cancer by making men's bloodstreams nearly eight times better at suppressing cancer cell growth. But this was for early stage, localized, watch and wait prostate cancer. What about for more advanced stage life-threatening disease? There had been sporadic case reports in the literature suggestive of benefit. Men, for example, with extensive metastatic disease, given maybe three years to live, goes on a strict plant-based diet. Four years later, it appears the cancer's disappeared. Six years in, he gets a little cocky and backslides a little bit on the diet. Cancer comes raging back, and he dies. But that could have been a total coincidence. That's the problem with case reports, which are kind of glorified anecdotes. You have no idea how representative the outcome is unless it's formally studied. But throughout the 20th century, all we had were these kinds of case reports until 2001. So we had all this preliminary evidence, based on all the case reports, that prostate cancer may be sensitive to diet, even after it metastasizes, may prolong survival, and even cause remission of bone metastases in men with advanced disease. So researchers decided to put it to the test in a four-month-long intervention. They figured too much saturated fat, too little fiber, and too much meat may be the biggest players in tumor promotion and progression, so they put people on a whole food, plant-based diet of whole grains, beans, seeds, and fruit, figuring this would be quite the departure from their regular diet. They included a stress reduction component in hopes of improving dietary compliance. OK, so who were these 10 men? They all didn't just have prostate cancer. They all had underwent a radical prostatectomy to remove their primary tumor, and then subsequently had increasing PSA levels, indicative of probable metastatic disease. PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's only made by prostate cells, and they just had their entire prostates removed, so the levels should be zero. The fact that they not only still had some PSA, but that it was rising suggests that the surgery failed, and the cancer has spread and is making a comeback. Here's where they started out before the study began. This is a graph of the speed at which each of their PSAs was going up. So, if after four months of eating healthy the graph looked like this, it would mean the diet had no effect. The cancer would presumably still be powering away and spreading just as fast as before. Instead, this happened. In two men, it looks like the cancer accelerated, grew even faster. But in the other eight men, the intervention appeared to work, apparently slowing down cancer growth. And in three, it didn't just slow or stop, but appeared to reverse and shrink. Why the different responses? Well, in the Ornish study, the more people complied with the diet and lifestyle recommendations, the better they did. 
Dietary changes only work if you actually do them. Just because you tell people to start eating a whole food plant-based diet doesn't mean patients actually do it. One can use fiber intake as a proxy for dietary compliance, since all whole plant foods have fiber, and Ornish's patients about doubled their fiber intake from 31 to 59. How did this group do? They started out even worse, averaging 14 grams a day, and only made it up to 19 grams a day. That's not a whole food plant-based diet. That doesn't even make it up to the recommended minimum daily intake. If you look closely, only four men increase their fiber intake at all, so maybe that may explain the different responses. Like, how did patient 2 do? The man whose fiber improved the most had the best PSA result, and the man whose fiber intake dropped the most had the worst PSA result. Here's the graph. And indeed, it appears the more change they made to their diet, the better their results. The researchers concluded that a plant-based diet, delivered in the context of stress management, may slow the rate of tumor progression, and unlike other treatments, may give patients some control over their disease. And, as Ornish pointed out, the only side effects are beneficial ones. So I'm talking to a group of men with prostate cancer. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear about magnets. You know, they don't want to hear that the atmosphere has been spiked by the Pope and it's raining down prostate cancer. They want to hear a way that, by the way, you don't know what a prostate is. Prostate is the size of a walnut. It sits in front of your rectum. So this is when the doctor, they used to do the, the oral, uh, I mean the fingers uh, up your anus to, to squeeze the prostate to see if it's hardened or enlarged. It's just uh, underneath the bladder, the urethra, the tube the man urinates through, it goes down through the prostate, and it goes, and if the prostate becomes swollen or enlarged, it pinches the urethra, and a man's got to pee six, seven times a night, and it ne never feels like he can empty his bladder. And you got four or five choices. You got, uh, you got hormone therapy, you got chemotherapy, you got proton therapy, you got radiation, you got different therapies, or you got surgery. If they do surgery, and a surgeon, you better get a good one, slips a millimeter, you wear a diaper the rest of your life, you know, this, this man's talking to me. He wants something solid. I sent him this video. He said, can it really make a difference? That is an interventional clinical trial. The intervention, they intervened with a whole food plant-based diet. And those are your results. Who got the most benefit? The one that... Compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Compliance. Another factor. You got, we, we teach compliance. Yeah, it's the one that, that followed it. That science. That convinced Dave. He said, I got to give up this diet, <laughs> and he's on it now. Science convinces honest hearted people. But predisposition to certain set beliefs, you won't give it up even if God said it. Though a man be raised from the dead, they still won't believe. This is science. So uh, now I'm saying there's some bogus science out there. Yes. You got to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Matthew 10, verse 16. So where do I start? Where do I start? Well, uh, this is my suggestion. If I was talking to somebody 19 years old, some young kid. For Raymond O'Valey, fancy way of saying a hole in your heart. An ischemic stroke, ischemic meaning narrowing down the blood vessels. Ischemic stroke in patients with pulmonary embolism. Ah, what's it say? A prospective cohort study. This is what you do. You just go to... Uh, I'll tell you where in a second. This is a very simple diagram of a cohort. Cohort means a group. You got to specify. That's all cohort means group. Uh, cohort study design. Because this is almost up there with the uh, randomized clinical trial. Well, I don't know what a cohort study is. Here's the answer this is what you do. National Cancer for Biotech. By the way, your tax dollars are paying for this. If you're paying taxes, you're paying for this. The National Center for Biotechnology Information is part of the United States National Library of Medicine, a branch of the National Institute of Health. And the National Library of Medicine has, has this archive called Medline. It is accessed through an interactive program called PubMed. That's it. You go to your computer, pubmed.gov, and then I'll, I'll illustrate it. 
It's a full text uh, archive of biomedical. It's a user-friendly interface to get to Medline. It's not as, as narrowed down and focused as Medline, but it's much easier to use. gives you a broad perspective over many things. Compiled by the National Library of Science. So I'll use an example. I got diabetes. <clears throat> what should I do? Thank you. How? <laughs> Good answer. How? Change your diet and exercise. All right, diet and exercise. Uh, is there any science behind what you just said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. PubMed.gov, I did it. Can you read what I typed in on top? Exercise, insulin resistance. You've got the best eyes in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Exercise, insulin resistance. I typed it in. Bang. Can you see how many articles came up? Mm -hmm. 6,600. Collection from the you know these are these are these are academic journals. These are this is not www.quackery.com. It's <laughs> it's scholarly academic journals. Is there some false science? Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you think I believe everything I read? No, I don't. But you got 6,600. Now can you see out to the side? You got to have good eyes. It tells you what kind of trial it was. Randomized control trial. Randomized control trial. Do you see out right to the side of it? It says that. It tells you what kind of trial it is. And so I said, just go down and choose out the randomized control trials. But you got 6,600. All 6,600 say the same thing. Every one of them. All of them. I just clicked on one, which came out of the uh, Canadian Center of Science and Education. The effect of eight weeks, now anybody can read this kind of thing. The effects of eight weeks aerobic exercise, I blew it up. This is what it says. Significant differences have been observed in insulin resistance, fasting glucose, and plasma insulin between the groups after eight weeks. Did exercise help? Mm -hmm. It did. It did. Now, if you're in China and you get Chinese studies from PubMed, Singapore, Malaysia, China, and you read these, here's 10,000 studies, they all say the same thing. Now, let's get up tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, take a walk. <laughs> what are they going to say? That's science. That's science. And today they're saying, you can go to YouTube, cure for diabetes, bacon and butter three times a day. Great. Is it true? Can you find that on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, you can. The cure for diabetes, two eggs. You want to lose weight? You get you get a the, the the master cleanse. You get a cup of maple syrup. You put in two teaspoons of lemon juice. You put in some salt. I and Newt spin around three times in a full moon. Bark like a dog, and you lose 25 pounds. And you're gonna lose 25 pounds on plutonium. People are crazy today. They have disconnected from reality. Thy word is truth. John 17:17. 17, 17. And boy, to try to it's like pulling teeth trying to get somebody away from those conspiracy theories. They will not give it up. Who is they? You know, you don't know who they are. BMI, plasma, insulin, insulin resistance. I mean, you want you got metabolic syndrome. This is your answer. And then my last suggestion: Has your science passed through the book Ministry of Healing, Medical Ministry, Councils and Diets and Foods? Has your science passed through and been filtered by God's Word? That's it. I had a I had my first experience with this. Dr. Burnell Baldwin, who nobody knew here, he was a brain scientist at Wildwood Hospital. I was a seven-day Adventist for about three months. I was teaching a class. I was teaching a class on brain science. I knew nothing about it. I got a few few references from Mrs. White. I knew nothing about it. In walked Dr. Baldwin, one of the most renowned brain scientists on planet Earth, sat down in the class. I said, "Oh no, <laughs> oh no." And all I did from that point forward was quote Mrs. White. The brain can communicates to the body as a, wire, a telegraph wire is over a thing. I'd read it, Dr. Ball would say, Amen. <laughs> he couldn't argue. 3T, 20, page 272. I read it, Dr. Ball, Amen. <laughs> he couldn't argue. They can't argue if you've got science. Science filtered through the Bible. And so, uh, last but not least, almost. I worked in West Africa. This is the hub of Ebola, right? And Liberia, the origination place of, of, of Ebola. In fact, on, our, on the website there at Butler Creek, you can go to the back, the videos, and this in Liberia. And it is a polio rampant there, and every kind of hepatitis and this, that, and the other. 
I got sick and almost died there twice. I mean, one time dangerously close. I was anointed, three plates, I was almost dead. Then I got something like typhoid fever, almost died again. I called up CDC and I said, what kind of vaccinations can I get to go back there? Risk and benefits. You weigh the risk and the benefits. And this is what I didn't have. Hepatitis A, typhoid, yellow, yellow fever, they require you to go to the country. I already had that. Hepatitis B and meningitis. And I said, I don't trust the vaccines. I don't like to take vaccines, but my track record there has been death, death, and almost death. <laughs> and I got those vaccines. Do I recommend those? Not at all. Unless you're going to spend a year in uh, Guinea and Liberia, then you might want to think about it. I'm just saying risk and the benefits. That's all. Fully inform yourself. Understand what a randomized control trial is. Understand the four phases uh, that any drug passes through. Understand what God's book says. Understand the risk and the benefits. Pray it all out. Let God show you what to do. That's it. And then last but not least, make sure you run it through the filter. The ministry of the healing. And by the way, in the ministry of healing, there is not one thing that conflicts with well, I was going to say, or, I was say true science. Same thing, the same thing, Barb. Or the Bible and true science. It's a unified front. And if we can unify with that in what we say, right? I proved it. 28 years of doing this, I proved it. With Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, 30-something countries, I proved it. Well, I've also proved if you don't, you're a failure. <laughs> I prove failure a lot of times, too. Yeah, if I could just, I'd, I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. But if you if you are able by God's grace to be reasonable, to be nice, to be sweet, I'm not, but I want to be, it, it works. And people come into the church. I'll pray. Our Father in heaven, yeah, this is this challenges us because of our uh, you know different uh, individual tendencies toward this, that, and the other. But health evangelism is the method chosen by heaven to reach the world. It's the right arm, the entering wedge. Help us to practice it in a way that is approved by heaven. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.